All right. So today I'm going to finish the, I'm going to review and finish the telescopes. I've been working all weekend trying to make you guys something so that you can use the recording a little easier. Let's see. I'm going to start this. Okay. So let's see if you guys can see this. For some reason, I like Captain Sparrow a lot. I don't know why I like Captain Sparrow so much, but I, I kind of like Captain Sparrow. So refracting telescopes says they use lenses. This is the kind of telescope that when we talk about telescopes that you normally you know, have envisioned, like Captain Sparrow looking into the ocean with a telescope. And there's something wrong with this Captain Sparrow image. Can you guys tell what's wrong with this image? When you look through a telescope like this, you close the other eye. You don't leave the other eye open. That's weird. You can't leave it open. Your image is totally going to be gibberish. So this is not real. He's not really looking. He's just portraying himself as a pirate, I guess, looking through a telescope. So every time you look through a telescope, if it's at night, you may not need to close the other eye, but normally you would naturally close the other eye. Now, the telescopes that have lenses, they're called refracting telescopes. So the refraction of light is the basis of refracting telescopes. And so when light, white light goes through a prism, it bends. And the reason it bends is because it's slowing down. So as the white light comes in, it slows down, therefore it appears to be bending. And not all light bends the same way. Red light bends a little less as it goes through the prism, and then violet and blue bend more. And that makes the spectrum that you see, you see all the colors of the spectrum as it goes through the prism. Now, a lens does exactly the same thing as a prism. In fact, I made this yesterday. It's a prism. It's a prism just like that. It's flat here, and it's got little uh, prism things at the end and when light goes through here it doesn't have to be white light it can be red light when it goes through this prism it bends and it comes to a point here called a focal point now we say the distance between the focal point and the prism is called a focal length of this prism which is acting just like a lens so here's an image of a lens here we call this a convex shape or it's curving outward here like that these are the lenses that you normally use to read newspapers, see, you know, like something in your finger you want to get out with the tweezers. So you, you use these lenses here to magnify the images normally. And if you hold this lens into the sun and you have a sheet of paper behind it, at some point, the image of the sun becomes really, really sharp and starts burning the paper. The distance between the middle of the lens here and where the image is focused that's called a focal length of that lens. Every lens has a focal length. And when it comes to a focus here, we say this is a focal point of a lens. Now, as I showed you, because lenses act just like a prism, you have something called chromatic aberration in a single lens. So what happens is that the lens itself acts like a prism. And so different lights come to a different focal points. The red focal point is over here because it bends the least. The blue bends the most, so it's close, closer to the uh, lens itself. And so there's a huge problem, this chromatic aberration. If you look through a lens that has chromatic aberration, this is what you see. You see halos around the moon. You see really ugly, fuzzy images like this. So to correct this image, we normally use two lenses. When you use two lenses, we call them the achromatic lens. Achromatic lenses are basically correcting for the blue and the red light. Sometimes the blue and the green and the red light, they all come to one single focal point together, at least very, very close to it. So we say these are achromatic lenses. Normally they're made of flint glass, very hard, crown glass, very soft. And again, the distance between the lens and where the image is focused is called focal point of the lens. At this point, you can have a camera at the focal point and you can take a picture. However, to see the image, 
you need another lens, which is basically a magnifier. We call this second lens an eyepiece. Now, this is the main lens of the telescope. The light that comes in from infinity is parallel beams of light. These parallel beams of light hit the lens. They come to a focus here. And then this is the observer here. The observer looks through the lens and it magnifies this image at the focal point. So refracting telescopes need to have at least two lenses for visual inspection. One we call an eyepiece. And the main lens we call the objective that collects the light and brings it to a focus. The job of the eyepiece is to magnify this image at the end. But you don't need an eyepiece to have a telescope though. You can have a telescope just to take pictures, like a camera lens. It's also a telescope if it's a telephoto lens. Now, what's the difference between an objective lens and an eyepiece? The focal length. The focal length of the objective lens is much longer. The focal point for an eyepiece is much shorter. So the magnifiers have very short focal lengths. The objective lenses have a very long focal length, at least a lot longer than the eyepiece. Otherwise, you will not have any magnification. So what we call a magnification is basically how many times you're magnifying the image. So here's Mars at 200 magnification. There's no units here, you just say X, which signifies times, like in multiplication. Say so it's magnifying 200 times. This is 400 times, about twice as big as this. This is 1200 times, which is six times as much as this, three times as much as this. So how do we know what the magnification of a specific telescope is? It has to do with the focal length of the objective and the focal length of the eyepiece that you're using. And so we have to divide these two numbers. So we say magnification is equal to the focal length of the objective. In this case, in our example, that's 600 inches. Focal length of the eyepiece is two inches. 600 divided by two gives you 300 times magnification. If the eyepiece is changed and we have a one inch focal length eyepiece, then the answer will be 600 times. If you use a half an inch eyepiece, 600 divided by 0 0.5 gives us 1,200 times magnification. So every single telescope has multiple eyepieces. And when you magnify, like I'm magnifying Saturn here, more magnification doesn't necessarily mean a better image. There's a couple of problems here. One is the atmosphere that blurs the images. And one is the act of magnification itself. This is Saturn, and Saturn is considered an extended object where stars are not extended. They're just point sources of light. So when you look at the star, it's like looking at a tip of a needle from a thousand miles away. But when you look at Saturn, it actually has a size in the sky. It's got an angular size in the sky. So when you magnify it, as you magnify, you're spreading the available light. So the more you magnify, the less light you're gonna have. And then eventually the image breaks down where you have too little light and you just can't see enough detail. So that's why I suggest that if you ever have a telescope, use lower magnification first for every given night. Every night is different. And so then you magnify a little more until the image starts breaking down and it's useless and you go, okay, that's the limit of the magnification. Now, reflecting telescopes use reflection of light. And Sir Isaac Newton is not the inventor of a reflecting telescope. He's an inventor of a reflecting telescope called a Newtonian telescope. So let's see why he even had to invent the Newtonian telescope. Here is a reflecting telescope. This is a round mirror viewed from the side. The light is coming in, as you can see, it's parallel beams of light hit the surface of this mirror. And because it hits the surface and it bounces back, it never has to go through the medium. Therefore, reflecting telescope does not have chromatic aberration. It's pure color, no color problems with a reflecting telescope. So now it's bringing it back here to a focal point. You can see all of these rays are coming back to a focal point here. 
at this point, all we need is an eyepiece to see it. So there's an eyepiece magnifier. Now, if an observer is present to look through here, we got a problem. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that all the light is hitting the back of his hat and his hair. So the light actually never reaches the surface of the mirror. That's why Sir Isaac Newton invented the reflecting telescope. Prior to that, they were tilting the mirror a little bit so that the image is uh, focused at the edge here. So let's say you're looking at something um, to the side, the image is formed over here. But that image is highly deformed and it's not really usable. That's why he had to invent the Newtonian telescope. All right, so here's a Newtonian telescope. He decided to put a little tiny flat mirror here and reflects the light at a 45 degree angle and focuses actually over here. This is a focal point and here is the eyepiece. And so you have to look through the telescope like this to the side. This is also can be called the objective. So objective mirror, not an objective lens in this case. And here's your eyepiece over here. The eyepiece is in the top end of the telescope is in the entrance of the light. So this is not very good. If you were to put a hundred pound camera here, telescope would be out of balance. So they're not really that great. They're great for buying something inexpensive like this telescope here, which gives you fantastic views and it can be had for like a thousand dollars. However, reflecting telescope require a lot of fussing. You see there's uh, some adjustments here. You have to tilt the mirror just right. The tilt of this mirror and the tilt of the second mirror here are very important. So you got to get that right all the time. If you put this inside the car and take it to Anzo Borrego Desert, then you have to keep adjusting it when you get there, like a half an hour of adjustment. And then here's the eyepiece here. This gentleman here is focusing the eyepiece. Everybody's eye is a little different. So this is called a focuser. Focuser moves the eyepiece in and out towards or away from the focal point until it focuses. This is called a finder scope, which is a little tiny refracting telescope with a crosshair. And you put the image of the moon or the star in the crosshair. And then um, you found it. Then you look at it with high magnification in the main telescope. So that's a finder scope. Now this Newtonian telescope can get really awkward. Take a look at this guy here. It's an awesome telescope. He's got like a 30 inch telescope. That's the diameter of the objective is 30 inches. He can see things that my telescope 24 inches cannot see because he can collect more light. It's like a light bucket. But look where he is. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be there in the winter time when it's wet. The dew settles on, the, on this ladder and I fall down and I kill myself just so that I can see a better image of Saturn. I don't think so. So that's why they built uh, the Cassegrain telescope. Cassegrain telescope have an advantage that they act, this appear to be like a refracting telescope. The focal point is behind the objective, just like a refracting telescope. So it's much, much more practical for professionals to mount something heavy, like a hundred pounds right behind this mirror here. So this makes it also very, very short. You have the light coming in, hitting the primary objective. That's a big mirror, reflects back, hits the surface of the secondary mirror. In this case, is curved outward, a convex secondary mirror. It bounces right through the hole that is drilled into the primary mirror, and it comes to a focus here. So two advantages, it's very compact, and the focal point is behind the primary mirror. That's a huge advantage for who? For professional telescopes. Like what? Like the Space Telescope. So this is the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope has a primary mirror, just like my mirror. Here is a mirror. And the light comes in from the front. This is the cover. They open it up. Light comes in, hits the surface of the primary mirror, and then bounces, hits the surface of the second mirror here then bounces, goes through the hole in the center of the primary mirror. There is thousands of pounds of instruments back here. In fact, people can go inside of here. 
So the Hubble Space Telescope is a Cassegrain telescope. I'm going to move away. All right. So this is a new telescope that's going to go up into space. <clears throat> it's called the Weber Space Telescope. He was um, manager at NASA during the uh, Apollo program. That's why they named it after him. This is also a Cassegrain telescope. Now it's a gold mirror. The cover is uh, the surface of the mirror is coated with gold. All right. So this is good for infrared. Infrared light is like heat, but not all of it is like heat. We can see almost to the infrared with our eyes, but deep red is called infrared, it just means beyond red. So whatever is beyond red is referred to as infrared. This telescope is made to see the edge of space and time. The farthest things in the universe will be visible to this telescope. And, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to put it in orbit. It's a million miles away. It will be a million miles away when it's launched in October. And it's Cassegrain. Light comes in, hits the surface of this mirror, albeit it has multiple mirrors. In other words, instead of building one gigantic mirror that they couldn't put in a spaceship to send it out, this one opens up. So these multiple mirrors are made, and it opens up like a fan. The image hits the surface of this mirror, bounces, hits the second mirror here. This is a secondary mirror, goes through the hole in the center of the primary mirror. All the instruments are back here. Now this is the tennis court size sun shield, which is necessary because you never wanna point this telescope at the sun. And you also wanna keep it away from the sun because it's an infrared telescope. So you don't wanna heat up the telescope itself. And it's made of this material that is so impressive, something the size of a tennis court, one of these panels here, there's multiple panels. One of them weighs something like pound and a half, extremely light material. This is the lightest solid material that was ever built by human beings. Incredible stuff. All right, now, most of you probably don't know this guy. This is, Mr. Johnny Carson, right? Johnny Carson was a um, Tonight Show host for the longest time. When he got hired, he took his first paycheck and he bought this telescope with his first paycheck. He always talked about this. And this is a Cassegrain telescope. So he bought a Cassegrain telescope with his first, very first telescope is a Cassegrain. Very expensive telescope, by the way. This is the best telescope inch per inch ever manufactured. It's an awesome little thing. I bought one from, uh, for uh, Mesa College. We had one of these at school. It's called a Questar. Pretty awesome. Incredible thing. All right, so we have three different telescopes so far then. We have Cassegrain telescope that we just talked about. Light comes in, hits the big primary mirror, bounces back, hits the secondary mirror, bounces again, goes to the primary mirror. And this guy is looking with an eyepiece to magnify the image. This. It's called a Keplerian telescope or Kepler's telescope. It's really a refracting telescope, not exactly the same as Galileo's. Galileo had a little different lenses here, but um, it did the same thing. And this is a Newtonian telescope. The only difference here between a Newtonian and a Cassegrain is that Newtonian has the focus way in front of the primary mirror, and that makes it kind of awkward for professional use. Can I ask a question? Of course. Okay. Um, the Kepler telescope, is it kind of like when you take a selfie, the image is reversed? Um, you have a lens in your camera, in your um, telephone. So the lens, all it does, it brings a light into a focus. Just like you see this lens here, it brings a light into a focus, right? And that's what your camera is doing. Your camera is just a detector. It's a little tiny detector. It's like quarter inches in size. And it's got a little sensitive surface. It's all electronics. And so you have a lens, except it's multiple lenses to correct for chromatic aberration. So it corrects for color fringes. And so, yeah, it's the same thing, except you don't have an eyepiece. You see? That's all. 
like a camera lens will have multiple lenses just to correct for chromatic aberration. Otherwise it's acting exactly the same way. It brings the light into a focus. And then what you do with that light that is focused is your job. You can magnify it with your eyepiece or you can use a detector to take a picture. That's all. Does that answer your question? Oh, yay, I guess. Okay, so what else does a telescope do besides magnifying? Well, actually, this is the biggest job a telescope does, is to collect light. It's called light gathering ability, light gathering power of a telescope and so on. So now we have rain gathering ability of the telescope here. And it's exactly the same as collecting photons instead of collecting rain, you're collecting light. Same principles apply. The bigger the diameter of your opening, this opening is normally referred to as an aperture. Aperture just means an opening. So the bigger your opening, the more rain you can collect. Take a look, this has got a smaller opening. Maybe this is taller and it can collect just as much water, but it's got a smaller opening. So it will take much longer for this bucket to fill up than this bucket. Now, how do we know how much more rain we can collect with this bucket over this bucket? Well, the answer is the surface area of the bucket. In other words, what's the area here of this circle? It turns out that's dependent on the diameter of the bucket. So remember the area of a circle is equal to pi times the radius of a circle to the power of two. And that power two is a big thing because I figured something that you can do very easily to compare two telescopes. I figured that all you have to do is to compare the diameter to the power of two of one versus the diameter to the power of two of another. And so if you have a question like this on the exam, all you have to do is to get the diameter of one telescope to the power of two, compare with the diameter of another telescope to the power of two. So in this case, I am comparing a four inch lens and a two inch lens. So if I asked you how much more light can a four inch lens collect than a two inch lens, you might say twice as much, but that would not be correct because it's a pi times a radius to the power of two. So one way you can do this is to get the radius of four inches, which is two times itself, four times pi. So it'd be four times pi. And then this would be, radius would be one. One times one is one times pi. So this would be one pi times four pi. Well, you could do it that way. I think the easier way to do it, you can get the diameter of a telescope to the power of two, compare it with the diameter of a telescope to the power of two. So in this case, we have a four inch versus a two inch, say four to the power of two, divided by two to the power of two, that gives you four times more light gathering ability. So now we have a lot more light. The images are gonna be four times brighter. What does that mean? That means you can see four times fainter stars. It means you can see images that are four times brighter. So you can collect more light. You see fainter stuff. If you see fainter stuff, that means you can see farther stuff. So that's why we tend to make bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger telescope specifically on the ground. On the ground, we need to have as big a telescope as we can possibly make because our job here on the earth is to see farthest things in the universe. So you need to collect as many photons as you can because those images that are really, really far will be really, really, really faint. So collect every photon you possibly can. Let's say you have the best telescope in the world. Now you have to mount it. And this mounting problem on Earth is the biggest mechanical problem we have. Normally, if you have a tripod, all you need to do is to move the telescope up and down. That's called an altitude. So you can point it down towards the horizon or you can point it up or way up at the zenith. Or 
you need to rotate it. So to point something, you point it, you point it up and down and left and right. Left and right is called azimuth, up and down is called altitude, and together this kind of mount is called alt azimuth. So an alt azimuth is like a tripod. It goes up and down, left and right. Well, astronomers have a much better idea to use a telescope on Earth. You want to look through the telescope and then image through the telescope and then maybe show it to your son or your daughter. So for that reason, we have something called equatorial telescope. You see the equatorial name in the next slide. But here, I'm showing you how this equatorial telescope works. So if this is just like an altezimuth telescope. In other words, it goes up and down, left and right, and so on. However, one of the axis of motion is tilted, this one here. So this whole telescope rotates around this axis here. This is called a polar axis. This polar axis points at North Celestial Pole here. So if you follow this axis of a telescope, you end at North Celestial Pole. Now, where is the axis of the Earth pointing to? North Celestial Pole or South Celestial Pole. In the Northern Hemisphere, North Celestial Pole. All right, now, if I can point my mount to North Celestial Pole, as the Earth rotates, there's a rotation of the Earth here, it's in this direction. I can maybe move my telescope in the opposite direction of the Earth with the same axis with the same exact speed as the earth so in other words i'm using the same speed as the earth except in the opposite direction and i'm tilted the mount my tripod to be just like the earth so if you compare it to the earth this is that same telescope this is the polar axis is pointing to North Celestial Pole. Axis of the Earth is also pointing at North Celestial Pole, except my telescope is rotating in the opposite direction of the Earth. As the Earth rotates, my telescope is rotating. A little motor will do the job. You put a little motor with the same speed as the Earth, but in the opposite direction, moving my telescope. And you can keep the image in the telescope all night long, because otherwise, if you're looking at Saturn and you ask your friend to look at Saturn, it would have moved because the Earth is moving, the image of Saturn in the telescope will move. So this is called the equatorial mount. You need it on Earth. In space, not necessary. So here's how equatorial mount works. I know it looks really weird, right? Now, this telescope tube is pointing at North Celestial Pole also. So you don't have to move the telescope to the North Celestial Pole to use this telescope. All you need is the mount to move like this. So you turn your tube to point at any other direction, but this axis of the telescope always moves exactly the same way I'm showing you here. Exactly the same way. Opposite direction of the Earth, but in the same exact way. What is that All tripod tells... called again? I'm sorry, one more time. What was that tripod called? The equatorial mount. Thank you. You're welcome. Like an equator. Except yell. Equatorial. All right. So now, what's the biggest problem we have on Earth? The biggest problem we have on Earth is the second law of thermodynamics. What the heck is the second law of thermodynamics? Second law of thermodynamics is the most impressive law. It basically says energy moves from a high state to a low state, which means if you leave the, you know, your warm room window open, the heat from your room goes out. The coldness of the outside doesn't come in. So the heat goes towards the cold, right, all the time. Second law of thermodynamics, which is pretty amazing. It also explains why your room never cleans itself. And it also gives us the direction of time. Direction of time also goes in the same direction as the second law of thermodynamics. It also has to do with increasing entropy, which means messiness, 
if you don't clean your room, it gets more messy tomorrow. If you don't clean it tomorrow, it's going to get messy the day after tomorrow. That's also the direction of direction arrow of time. Time always moves in the direction of messiness. Your room never cleans itself, which is kind of a bummer, I guess. But that's life. So the heat of the sun heats up the earth. The ground is hot. The heat of the earth has to go up into the cold space. So at night, well, actually it actually happens in daytime too. It starts moving. But how it moves is interesting. And it makes the images look terrible. How it moves is with these little bubbles. These bubbles are called convection cells. You've seen convection cells if you look over your neighbor's house when they have a lot of heating going on inside their house. If you look at the stars in the sky, they seem to be moving around. Like in the desert, if you go to Las Vegas, you can see the cars are moving around. That's because of these convection cells. Now the degree of the turbulence in the atmosphere is called seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G, seeing. So seeing is rated from one to five. One is the worst, five is the best. So five is excellent. It only happens like five o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. When the earth is cooled down, there is no movement of the air towards space. So this lack of motion, this lack of um, disturbance in the earth's atmosphere allows you to see much better like this. This is what you expect to see if you start observing at 7, 8 o'clock at night. The bubbles are moving in front of your telescope. So the light is going through the bubbles, and this is what you see. And you have to take your time. So when you look at an image in the telescope, you wait for moments of good seeing. So take a look at the moments of good seeing right here. Look at these craters. Wait for a few seconds until they become clear. That's the moment of good seeing. If you go to space, bang. No bad seeing, perfect seeing all the time. Because there's no air in space, right? And so if you go to space, none of this is going to happen. This is stars blinking, right? Stars don't blink. They only blink because of those air bubbles I just showed you. The degree of turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere is called seeing. One way to tell is how much does a star twinkle. The more they twinkle, the worse the seeing is. So stars in space look like this. Perfect. No twinkles. All right, here's a space telescope. Obviously, it's got an advantage because there is no atmosphere. In fact, there's no, you know, a day and night. It does go into the uh, day side of the Earth. I don't even think they use it in the day side of the Earth because you'd never want to have sunlight enter the space telescope. But every hour and a half, right, you're going to have night. So it takes an hour and a half for a space telescope to go around the Earth one time. And then on Earth, we're making giant telescopes because all we care about is how fantastic light can be had by collecting more and more and more photons so you can see farther and farther. So light collection on Earth is the number one priority. We want to see the beginning of time. We want to see the very edge of space. Right? We want to see the farthest things that we can possibly see. This is the biggest telescope that is going to be built in the next decade. It's going to be online, I think, by 2024. You can see how big it is. It's about the width of the football field. It's a huge mirror, multiple mirrors. Again, Cassegrain, light comes in, hits this big mirror, bounces back, hits the second mirror, bounces again, goes through the hole here. And that's where the instruments are mounted behind the big gigantic primary mirror. Huge. This is called the ELT, Extremely Large Telescope. And it's going to be mounted in Chile, in South America, and it is so nice there in Chile, in Southern Andes. It hasn't rained there for 300 years. It's the driest place in the world. So you don't have to worry about clouds. Seeing is also the best in the world. There's only one place that I know of that has better seeing. That's in Hawaii. 
That's why Hawaii is the number one place in the world for basically clarity of the air, right? Seeing is the best. So what the seeing does, it enables you to see clear. That's called resolution. The telescope not only magnify, not only they collect light, but they also make the image sharper. The bigger the diameter, the sharper the image also. That's called resolution. I don't have any questions on resolution. It's kind of complicated a little bit. So only in lab class, we talk about resolution of the telescopes. All right, so what do we do here with seeing then with a giant telescope like that? The bigger telescopes also have bigger seeing problems because the bubbles are gonna be, you know, the telescope is much bigger than the bubble. So multiple bubbles are gonna be moving in front of this telescope. So how do we do this? How do we correct that? Well, remember the secondary mirror? Let's take a look. This is a secondary mirror. It's already built, right? So the second mirror has actuators. It's very, very thin also. These actuators change the shape of the secondary mirror in real time, like a thousandth of a second. Now, how do I know how much correction an image requires to get a perfect image? Well, that's where the lasers come in. So we shoot these lasers sodium lasers in the upper atmosphere, and we make a star. The telescope looks at that star. It knows what the image of that star in a perfect situation should be. And it continuously corrects for the lasers. So the lasers are on when you're doing your observation, and you correct for those observations by moving the primary mirror, the big mirror, and the second mirror with those actuators behind it, literally changing the shape of the mirrors in real time. But the only backdraw is that um, you see a little tiny part of the sky. You don't see a giant part of the sky like you would with the space telescope. Anyway, so in the next 10 years, there's going to be a whole new revolution in astronomy. We should be able to see the atmosphere of a planet outside of the solar system. So maybe we can find out if there's life in other solar systems. We just discovered the life in or planets outside of the solar system for the first time in 1990s. So now it's time to see if there's any life in any of those planets outside of the solar system. All right.